If you have your Bibles, please turn your Bibles to James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. If you don't have a Bible, sit next to a Christian. A Christian will always carry a Bible. I thank God for the freedom that we have in our country that we could still carry a physical Bible, which we don't have in some of the countries. So make the best use of the opportunity before that freedom is taken away from us. James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Elijah was a human being like us. And he prayed fervently that it, it might not rain. And for three and a half years, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its crops. Now, now Elijah was an ordinary human being, and I'll get to that one. But first thing is, what is the difference between the way we pray and fervently praying. Now, fervently praying is very different. Today, when we pray, we just sit down, we relax, we say, God, do something. I have exams tomorrow, so Lord, fill me with some math, physics, this and that. But fervently praying is very different. Fervently praying is like when the rats ate the wires of my car last week. And we had to take it to the um, showroom. So my wife and myself, we were driving slowly. The guy told somewhere it might stop. We are in the middle of this ring road. And twice the car stopped somewhere near Hennur. And from there onwards, we fervently prayed till we reached the showroom slowly. And literally, the whole time, we didn't know how to pray in English. So we prayed in tongues. And we reached no, fervently praying is like this. Um, you know, when I got invited to perform in North Korea, it was a great opportunity to represent India. This was in 2012 when I got invited. So this was a grand welcome from the government of North Korea. In fact, the only country that ever sponsored my mission trip was the government of North Korea. The performances were great. The audiences were amazing. We could not connect with them. They only clapped at the end of the performance. But they all clapped in unison. And, but suddenly, they told me that uh, we want you to stay back for another three days. Now, they, on, they had given me only one way ticket. They said, you come back. Uh, once you come, we'll give you the return ticket. And they didn't give me. They said, you have to stay for three more days to perform. I said, my contract is only for seven days. First, they asked you, can you stay? But basically, that is no option. You have to stay. They said, I said, I can't stay. They said, well, you have to stay. And then I prayed fervently. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I prayed throughout the night. Because I have no communication with the world. My phones are taken off at the airport. Anyways, it will not work in North Korea. But I fervently prayed passionately throughout that night. Next day morning, there was a knock at my door. The official came and said, this is your ticket. You, ha you have your ticket to leave this afternoon to China. That is fervent prayer. Where you are passionately interceding and putting everything into it. Now the book of James is a letter written by James, the leader of the Jerusalem church. This letter, this book was written mainly to encourage the scattered Jewish Christians who got scattered because of persecution. Remember that when you read the book of James, you have to remember how Christians have been scattered because of persecution. So James is writing to encourage the Jewish Christians who have scattered. Now, interesting that James calls Elijah ordinary. How dare he calls a superhuman as ordinary. Would you ever call Amita Bachchan ordinary? Even P.T. Usha? You would never. They will call uh, the Asian great sprinter, P.T. Usha. But James calls Elijah ordinary. Why? I want to spend some time on that. Now let me tell you a little bit about Elijah. Some things that we might not know about. 
and this is interesting about them now the distance between mount carmel to jezreel by the way if you go home and read first king 17 and 18 you will understand the background of why did he pray a prayer like this the distance between mount carmel to jezreel where ahab's palace is is around 27 kilometers the distance from here to the airport is around 32 kilometers so you can imagine that one now hussein bolt is supposed to be the fastest man who ran on this earth let's see how did he run bolt going very near comes you say bolt you say bolt storming through he takes it again blake gets the silver okay that's fine thank you so this is the speed he ran for 100 meters well even though the note says 9.83 seconds later on i found out that he even beat that one by 9.58 seconds now that speed is around 37.5 kilometers an hour so it would take him around 43 minutes with that clothing with that surface at the speed that he ran at 100 meters it will take him 43 minutes to cover 27 seconds now the bible says that there was a chariot there so let's go to the chariot picture please now the top speed of a chariot is 56 kilometers an hour it would take the chariot around 29 minutes to cover 27 kilometers now a half marathon is 21 kilometers the next picture abraham kiptum he is the world record holder from kenya he ran the uh, he ran the fastest 21 kilometers he ran at 58 minutes and 18 seconds which means it would take him around 77 minutes to cover 27 kilometers now let's see what the bible says first kings 1846 says then the lord gave special strength to elijah he tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of jezreel now next is my favorite picture even hussein bolt is shocked about elijah now this is how elijah would have dressed okay and this is hussein bolt's dressing and can you imagine elijah if we have to calculate he would have ran 27 kilometers in 28 minutes unimaginable in today's world we would say he would have taken a special drug as there would be match fixing or there's some problem with the clock because how can you imagine something like this the fastest man hussein bolt would have done it in about 43 minutes and elijah with no preparation with the same clothing that he was with it's almost like wearing a sari and running and he did it in 28 minutes or so when the spirit of the lord came now this is a superhuman and james calls him ordinary why why does he use this word he was an ordinary human being just like us you know why contrary to what other jewish teachers were saying james called him ordinary because the jewish teachers were saying that elijah was not born of a human father and mother whereas he was born of an angel which makes sense why he is able to do all these extraordinary things from the jewish writers they said that elijah was clothed with four elements of the earth that is earth water air and fire that's why elijah could do all these extraordinary things and james debunks that and says elijah was an ordinary human being like you and i born with the same nature to fall and to commit sin but if a man like this could fervently pray it did not rain on the earth for 3 and 1/2 years and later on it rained when he prayed and the earth produced its crops you know many times we think that there are certain people who are more special to jesus than others we think that there are certain people when they pray it works how much of faith do you have in your own prayers how quickly we are to go and shop around for prayers but do we have faith that there is only one mediator between us and god and that is jesus christ 
Do you have faith that your prayers can be answered just like anybody else? It is the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So why don't we have prayer, faith in our prayers? You know, somebody said this beautiful statement. Prayer is effective not because of great men and women who pray. But prayer is effective because of a great God who graciously hears his children. The greatness of the prayer is about God, not about us. It's not our fasting and praying 40 days, 21 days. You fast and pray. Pray because you want to pray. Don't think that by doing so much, by skipping chocolate, God will be moved. Come on. God has the power to answer in a second and he can take his own sweet time to answer too. Don't ever think that with your prayer you can manipulate the way God will answer. No. The greatness of your prayer is the greatness of God, not about us. It's nothing about us. And many times we, people think that if this person prays, things will work. Remember one thing. Reciting repeated words is the reverse of fervent prayer. Especially in the Pentecostal churches, we have this, you know. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, when you are just repeating, reciting, repeated words, your mind is absent. No wonder you can check Facebook and WhatsApp. And I challenge you, friends, when you are praying, use your mind and your heart, both I remember once in, when we in our apologetics DTS, we had a girl who wanted to become an IPS officer. She was from North India. And I asked her to pray for lunch. And she said, Lord, we are sinners. We don't deserve to live in this world. We don't deserve to eat this rice and dal and curry. And finally, she prayed for the food. And I said, I asked you to pray for food, not for a repentance prayer. But we have a, a formula. We have a format. No matter what the prayer request is, the first minute goes into the regular format. Because, you know, we don't think when we are praying. You know, it is so important. Fervent prayer is praying according to what moves you. And what moves you is according to what you know moves God's heart. Again, I repeat. Fervent prayer is praying according to what moves you. And what moves you is according to what you know moves God's heart. That's why it's so important for us to find out what is God's will when we pray. What is God's will when we pray? Don't say, God, I'm going to give you my first year's salary if you give me a good job. That is not praying according to God's will. You're not giving a choice to God. There are people who would come and say, brother, please pray for me. Now, I don't have the gift of prophecy or word of knowledge. I'll ask, what can I pray for you? They'll give me a full list. What, yes, what, no. And there is nothing else to pray for God's will. What is God's will? That is more important rather than just trying to do things the way we want. And finally, we are disappointed that God has not answered our prayers. What is God's will? That's the first thing. People would come and say, brother, please pray for me. Uh, for what? I have applied for a loan in SBI Bank. So please pray that it will be approved. Then I would say, sister, why don't you ask the Lord that he will provide you the finances? No, brother, that's a big amount. This is a small amount, so it is easier. Please stick to the prayer request I've told you to pray for. <laughs> no. Can't God give you the amount? The full amount is God so shorthand that he can only give you the advance? Simple, logical question. And I'll tell you a little more about that. But remember one thing. The, the Cambridge Dictionary says, fervent in Cambridge English Dictionary is displaying a passionate intensity, burning or glowing. To put it simply, to do anything fiercely means to do it with a great deal of enthusiasm. How do you pray? What is your position of prayer? Is there a passionate intensity when you pray? Are you saying, God, do something in Israel, do something in Ukraine? In Jesus' name, amen. No. But when the doctors say you have cancer, do you say, pray the same way? No. You would passionately pray. When your dear one is going through death, you would passionately pray. 
That is how Elijah prayed. Energetic is more accurate translation of the Greek word energomeni, from which earnestly derives. Now, a kind of prayer in wrought by the Spirit. It is a kind of fervent prayer is a kind of prayer in wrought by the Spirit. Now, in wrought by the Spirit, now the word in wrought means intricately embroidered. No, it is something very intricate, tightened together. That is what the word in wrought means. Now, in wrought by the Spirit is, it refers to something that the Holy Spirit has profoundly infused into a person's life, character, or actions. It indicates that the Holy Spirit has deeply influenced a person's heart, intellect, or behavior from inside. No, we never thought that all these things are part of prayer. Prayer is just getting up, kneel down, do a few things and go, no. Your character matters even in your prayer. No wonder many times we pray, nothing happens. And we start to shop around for prayer. Nowadays people outsource for prayers. Hmm? Outsourcing. Not just HP and Infosys. There are people who would send an offering suddenly. I say, sister, why did you send? Brother, why did you send? Brother, please pray for my children. You see? Now they have good money, they send money and pray. How's when I go for, you know, I, I live with families everywhere. It's very common. They'll first tell everything bad about their children, then give me an offering, and they'll say, please, when my, my son is going to come at 5 o'clock, so prayerfully talk to him. What prayerfully? I've given me the whole list about him. How can you? And the children already know that this is, this is a format that goes on. And tomorrow morning, Uncle Benny will go off. So no problem. I listen to him. No. Please have faith in your prayer. Do not outsource prayer. Do not shop around for prayer. Jesus is there everywhere. He is present in this church. And he is present over there in your homes. Do you have that passion when you pray? When you pray, do you believe that things happen? It is so important. I remember once I was preaching in, in, uh, in Brisbane. And there, one lady comes and says, Pastor, I want to, uh, we want to have lunch with you. I said, no, the pastor said he'll have lunch with me. And she went and fought with the pastor. This was an Indian family. Fought with the pastor and said, no, God told us that we should have lunch with Benny. Fine. Pastor said, I'll have dinner with you. Went. They treated me like king. Took me to the favorite restaurant ordered everything. The wife ordered the husband to order whatever I wanted. <laughs> everything was placed and as the wife, husband was getting things, the wife sat and she said, so pastor, tell me. I said, tell you what? <laughs> she said, tell me, tell me what's going to happen next in our family, in our business. Oh, I said, I am not one of those. <laughs> I, I, I don't have that knowledge. Then she said, but the message you preached was exactly what we are going through. I said, praise the Lord. Let God get the glory, but God never told me about you when I was preparing the message. You know what? Within five minutes, we finished the lunch and they dropped me off. <laughs> they were so disappointed. Friends, some of us might be like that. And you know, it is so easy as a minister to take advantage of you. And that's what is happening today. Read the scriptures, pray, ask God. Every prophecy that comes, go back to Jesus. And check, don't become blind followers of things. When we know how to check the star rating on Amazon and Uber, how much more we should be like the Berrien Church to check every message that comes in. Now, the practical aspect. We understood what is fervent prayer. We understood the way Elijah prayed. We saw that there was this supernatural aspect. I really hope one day we can see something like that. Imagine a runner running at a pace that nobody can ever even imagine. And then he gives the glory saying that the Holy Spirit came on me and I did that. That's what Elijah did. And he can do that today. He can do that. I'll tell you he can do that. In my book I covered one of the stories was about my shoes. You know, growing up, being a failure in school. By the way, my wife and myself, we are very compatible. She cannot 
play an instrument and I cannot sing, so we are quite safe in that one. And uh, she is nine standard up here and I'm 10 standard failed. Even that educationally, we are quite compatible in that way. In, in many factors, in that way, you know, it is very safe to do that. But you know, growing up, I, I grew up as a failure because I had so many questions that my teachers failed to answer my questions but rebuked me and I lost my interest in studies here in Bangalore. And finally, in my 10th standard, they called my parents and said, we have never had a single failure. Your son is going to be making history by being the first ever failure. So we want him to leave the school. So diplomatically, they kicked me out of the school. And today I tell the world that I could not finish my high school because the Indian educational system was not up to my standard. <laughs> because the same schools invite me as chief guests, graduation speakers, and I'm still a high school, sometimes principal come and say, Benny, can you please avoid that portion of your testimony? <laughs> uh, and young people, please don't use this as an excuse to not study, and uh, I'm not responsible for that. And, but, you know, always, you know, in, in, in our culture, you do well, you get good, good clothing, you know, branded clothing. Based on your marks, the brand level increases. Since mine was always in single digit, I always got shoes, clothing with small spelling mistakes. Like Loto was Luto, Adidas when D was missing, you know, Reynolds was Reynolds, you know, some small, very small, Bata was Buta, you know, these were the things. But I always longed for having an original shoe, longed. And I will not tell the whole story, but you'll see this in the book, that, you know, God gave me a beautiful, amazing Nike green color shoes in 98. And I took it. When I went to wear it was small in size. I went back to Jesus. I said, God, why do you excite me like this? I was so excited and now it is small in size. And my faith in God was so childish. You know, childish is not looking down, but... You know, childish faith is like, wow, incredible faith that is. That I said, God, you either de decrease the length of my feet or increase the length of my shoe. And you know what? God is such a wise God. He increased the length of the shoe that I wore it for two years. Thank God he didn't in decrease my length of my feet. Then other things that I have, then there will be a problem. But that is a supernatural miracle from an ordinary person. I'm not an extraordinary person. I'm not someone great. I have so many flaws. You talk to the apologetics DTS students, they will list you everything about me. But in the midst of that, I fervently prayed and I could see that. My question is, why did Elijah's prayers work? And why our prayers don't work? Why are we so busy shopping for prayers? There are times people call me, please pray for me. What can I pray for? Anything, brother. Anything. Just pray anything. What is this? We need to have, even the way we pray, there should be something, there should be a content in that. So why? First thing, Elijah learned to wholly rely on God. That's the first thing. Elijah learned to wholly rely on God. First Kings 17, 5 and 6 says, So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Kiriath Brook east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. With this we know Elijah was non-vegetarian, but I would never have expected that God would have used the most unlikely bird, a raven or a crow, to take food. Have you ever seen raven saving some food for somebody? And here, every morning and evening, Elijah had no other choice other than trusting the Lord. He was in a place, he was in hiding. He had nothing, but he wholly relied on God and God sent the help from the most unlikely source. The ravens fed him every morning and evening and he took water from the brook. He trusted in God and God provided. When was the last time you trusted the Lord? Today, you know, when any need comes, yeah, we pray, but we look at the bank, we look at the credit card, we look at a rich aunt. If not, you'll sell somebody's guitar to get some money 
and pay off the bills. But when did you last trust God? I remember when I was doing my discipleship training school, I didn't have toothpaste for tomorrow morning. That night, I'm telling God, how will I go and preach the gospel? Here, somewhere in Kamanali, 1998, I'm telling God, how will I preach the gospel with stinky mouth? First of all, I only brush once a day, so I saved a little bit of toothpaste there, and then I don't have any toothpaste left. And God said, I'll provide. I have, and I have this very strong habit that I will never borrow money at any condition. Bible college days, when I ran out of uh, uh, shampoo, I used rinse soap, same clothing and my hair, same thing. But I would never borrow money. And next day morning, there was a knock at the door at 6 o'clock. And there was this girl called Carolyn. She was a staff. And she said, Benny, God told me to give you this toothpaste. And she left. Wow. Now, don't call her a raven. She's not a raven. She is, she's a human. She was my staff. But you see, just like how the ravens brought God, when was the last time you tasted God's provision like this? The question is, do you have patience to wait? Somebody said, time spent waiting on God is never wasted. Okay? God told me to travel to every country in the world. And he said, I will provide for you. In 2001. I had 1,000 rupees a month as a YWA missionary. When Jesus said, I'll, I will make you travel the world, I said, okay, God, if you want me to travel, you have to be my provider. I made this deal. I will never ask for money, will never borrow money, will never take a loan from the bank or trust the credit card. Till today, I have my financial principles. God took me to 257 countries. Debt free, never asked for money, never found a sponsor, nothing. In fact, all these countries, till I broke the world record, all these countries I paid my own tickets and I don't have a salary. But never ran short as long as I was walking in the right path. My question for you is that as you pray, do you wholly rely on God or do you have plan B, plan C and other options? Where is your faith today, friends? Where is your faith? Same thing with Chai 316, the next picture. God told me in 2011, go and buy a piece of land. Next day morning, I went. I didn't wait for some fleas to come, something, some hint, some proof. You can ask for any proof. God is not going to change. It is we who have to change. I trusted the Lord. I bought the land. He said, build this building. It was five crores. I said, how will you provide? He said, use your CDs. I said, God, CDs are outdated now, 2012. He said, don't worry, I'll create a market for you. And he says, don't put a price, let people decide the price. I said, God, this is a very bad idea. I come from India, anything that is free, we take it seriously. Are you sure that something like this would work? You know, we want to update God with the breaking news as though he has forgotten what is happening in our lives. And I obeyed God. In two years, five crores came from an outdated CD. And he provided everything. Can we trust God till the very end? You know, it's so beautiful when you rely on God. It is better to put your confidence in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, the Bible says. The second one, Elijah's, sorry, the second one is Elijah daringly prayed for God-sized miracles. He daringly prayed for God-sized miracles. He had no problem in praying that because he knew his God. 1 Kings 17, 22, 21 and 22 says, And he stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned and he revived. A dead boy's life came back to life. Elijah prayed that. Do you pray for God-sized miracles? Before I close with this particular thing. Well, let me finish this story. You know, I was in Somalia. Now, before going to Somalia, I have to get a contact. I had no contacts. I was performing at the FIFA World Cup in Germany in 2006. During the week, I was performing at the cultural stages weekend in churches and once I was preaching how I was willing to live for Jesus and die for Jesus, twice I was close to getting beheaded in one of the countries. And all these things, at the end, a family comes to me at the table that I was signing CDs and said, Brother, there was a powerful sermon. Uh, have you been to Somalia? I said, No. 
They said, we are from Somalia. It will be wonderful if you can go. I said, I would love to go, but I have no contacts. They said, well, my whole family lives there. They're all from another faith. It will be nice if you can share the gospel because we can't go back there because we will be killed. But in your sermon, you said you're ready to die. So it will be nice if you can please go and share the gospel to our family. <laughs> now, you can't say, please, you're misreading my message. No. So I prepared. What do I do? I call my parents. I said, there is a possibility that I might be killed in Somalia. So don't, if you don't hear from me, that's the end. So you prepare to die. That's the best freedom you have to share the gospel. When did comfort and luxury become part of mission field requirement? Never. Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If anyone chooses to live, they will lose their life. If anyone chooses to lose their life, will find life in Christ. So now I prepared everything, got my visa in London, and all set, I've been contacting this family, their medical doctors, and they wrote to me a week before saying, please don't come. Five Christians' heads have been beheaded. It's extremely dangerous. Please don't come. I said, I'm sorry to hear this doctor, but I'm ready to come because I've already told my parents I'm coming and I'm ready to die. They said, you might be ready to die, but we are not ready to die. Don't come. And then they said, we are moving to another city. We will not be there to receive you. I have no contacts. Easiest thing is to cancel the trip. But I prayed for a God-sized miracle. I said, God, all my contacts are gone. I'm going to one of the most dangerous countries. Would you please provide me a contact? And I waited for God. And God said, go, Benny. I will provide for you. I'm sitting in the aeroplane, one of the worst airlines in the world, called Dalo Airlines, where one wing is tied with a rope, another wing with a duct tape. They have not passed any tests, but that's the only airline that will take you there. As, I, as I'm there, the crew member comes and sees my guitar. He says, have you been to all these countries? I said, yes. Where are you going? I don't know. Whom are you meeting? I don't know. Everything I don't know. He says, okay, play a song. So I took out my guitar mid-air, and I played a song. When I finished playing, he says, Benny, my friend is the head of the media. Would you like to meet him? I said, I would love to meet him. At this point, I'm ready to meet anybody, even a pirate or anyone. So as the plane landed, well, he calls Abdullah. And Abdullah says, tell him to wait. I send my driver. Driver comes, picks me up, takes me to the hotel, puts my bag there, and I come down there. And then here on the left-hand side is Abdullah, the head of the media. Right-hand side is Bill from the United Nations. They said, can you play a song? I played a song. and. Then he says, tomorrow is an incredible day where the elite of Somalia is going to come. Would you like to represent the international community, perform and share your testimony? I said, I would love to, but tomorrow I have a flight. Abdullah says, well, why don't you go day after tomorrow? We can fix a plane for you. I said, how can I trust you? How Fixing coffee, tea is fine. Fixing a plane... He said, what time do you have to be day after tomorrow? Five o'clock, done. He takes the call. He just makes this cold call. Cancel tomorrow's flight. Reschedule it for day after tomorrow. It's so fake. So I looked at Bill and I said, at least you will tell me the truth. Bill says, Benny, Abdullah's family owns the airlines. They can do anything they want. And imagine the entire aircraft flight was rescheduled so that I could share my testimony in the most one of the most persecuted places and give the glory to Jesus. Now, this is a God-sized miracle. When is your adventure with Jesus? Otherwise, life will be so cold in this world. I have so many stories where God has done incredible things, blinded the officials because they were going to cut my hair off. All kinds of things. But you know, you must fervently pray to experience this beautiful journey with Jesus Christ. My third point is Elijah's prayers directed the world back to God. You see, this is very important. When we see answers in our prayers, when we see God working, it should never be about us. It should be about Jesus. Always, whenever God has done something great, make sure that you point it back to Jesus Christ. For me, everywhere I go, even my shirt. My shirt says, thank you, Jesus, I'm an Indian. There's a story behind that. But I want to make sure that people will know that Jesus is part of my journey. When I was speaking at St. Stephen's College, 
one of the buddhist girls came and told this boy saying why this guy is giving credit to jesus it is all about his hard work and his will power and i said no it is jesus who changed my life because i was going to kill myself at 16 but you know friends my mother prayed mothers don't give up prayer fathers start praying <laughs> prayers work my mother prayed and prayed and prayed at 16 at the verge of committing suicide planned everything my mother was at 4:30 in the morning she prayed it's not that jesus is fresh at 4:30 it's just that she that was the only time she had and she prayed and prayed at the age of 16 my brother and myself both of us we had a huge fight and i took a brick to kill my brother that's when my mother came in between and she said if you want to kill your brother you have to kill me first that's how much i was filled with anger and we went to that youth camp on the second day least bothered about that second day i heard the audible voice of jesus christ and jesus said benny even though you are called useless i can transform your life and make you a new person and jesus transforms my life and he does that and today you know elijah if you go and read first kings 1837 you see that he always made sure that the prayers pointed it back to god and the fourth one is elijah prayed fervently until he caught a sight of the answer seven times he prayed and then finally a small cloud comes in first kings 1842 to 45 you can go home and read this and you will see that how elijah did not give up praying seven times do we give up praying when we pray do we even i don't have time to talk about my pakistan story but i i remember 334 phone calls in four days to the ministry of interior in islamabad every single call was rejected the only call i got was from the indian telecom saying why are you calling pakistan so often <laughs> every door was closed but in the book you will see of how god opened a door in an elevator in north korea when i met two officials from pakistan so remember these four things dear friends the reason why our prayers don't work is because of these factors that we have missed out first thing make sure that you lean wholly on god rely wholly on god secondly make sure that when you are praying pray for god sized miracles pray for that god will be glorified not us it's all about jesus it's he should get the glory that's why you see my my life is an ordinary life but i've experienced god in a mighty mighty way and i'm still an ordinary person but the way god has provided is just amazing because i've prayed for god sized miracles and make sure that your prayers direct the world back to god it's not about you don't become don't have these small little god men in your life god women in your life it's all about jesus he is the one who does the miracles he is a miracle wonder working god and we are just tools and lastly Elijah prayed fervently until he caught a sight of the answer.